she is starting to damage my car. You're listening to I know who I am. That's true. You know who you are. Um, well, relatively. Well, of course you do. What are you, what are you, nuthatch? You got mental problems. Eh, it could be. Yeah. So, what this is, however, is TMG Cast. Comics Podcasting. On the Edge of Civility. To muggy. Stop it! Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it! Dude, the To muggy Cast. I don't like that. Why? Because it sounds dumb. And you only do it to irritate me, you fuck. (laughs) That hurts me. It should. Because you're hurting my brain. Well, that's odd. This is episode 224. (laughs) 224. (laughs) I'm giving away a new box of shite. Oh, yeah? Yep. Ooh. A new Twitter follower came around. And uh, actually, before she followed... Um, she was having a conversation with another follower. Oh, wow. And He's she popular. Said, and she said that she had to skip buying comics this week. And I'm like, oh, you can't go without comics. Have some free comics. So by the time this is heard, those will be shipped out and even received. So, booyah, you got some new books. <laughs> it's rather unfortunately... DC Week. DC. And it's one of the bigger DCs we've had in quite some time. It is interesting that they have been sneaking up on us. A little bit, but, you know, it looks like some of them are going to sneak right the fuck back now. Starting. To probably, probably said. Probably starting with Superman. Superman. Really? Because they lose JRJR soon. Oh, dear. And they've already lost Johns. Where does uh, JRJR go? I don't know. He never gets into the news until he actually shows up on the book. Well, that is kind of cool, I have to say. Yeah, that's a little bit better than just going, Well, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'll see you over here, and bye! (laughs) So, over in Superman 44, there's a new Royal Flush Gang. Uh, Yay? Uh, I, I love, suppose. I mean, I'm always maybe? excited to, to, to um, see a classic villain. A new Royal Flush Gang appears to take advantage of Clark's identity breach, but they're pretty well trounced when somebody 10 beats King Senseless for smacking her brother around. 10? Yeah. To show how street. Is yeah, that what eight, it is? Ten? yeah, Ace and 10. Ugh. Beats the king senseless for smacking her brother around. Uh, the police try to arrest Clark, but he has to quell the hostage crisis at the plant, um, which is being attempted by Livewire, of all people, that I still don't know why is in this book, or any kind of remote challenge to somebody like Superman, even in the condition he's in. <laughs> I think their goal with this was to get a bunch of B-level guys to be like, anybody, you know, <laughs> anybody... Thinks they have the cojones to go after the friends and family. Well, yeah, because the shockwave, Killer Frost, and Croc for some damn reason. Show that makes up. no sense. That's that. That's out of nowhere. General Lane is happy as a pig in shit about all of this, praising Lois, who doesn't really see it the same way. <laughs> Dylan, former Planet employee, blames Clark for Titano killing his wife. Perry gets hit by a ricochet, fires Clark. And uh, Soup's tapes an ultimatum to villains. Um, A rather creepy one. Yeah, I did not like Superman saying sentences like that at all. Well, I mean, (laughs) I'm going to refer to you to my feelings on the Superman film when he killed somebody. And you're like, dude, it's the movie. Like, this is the new Superman. You know, (laughs) I don't like it. But this is the base level that all Superman is supposed to come from. 
Yeah, but this is no longer the same Superman. Like, this is the base level. Ugh. That's what you have to accept. That's, is that's it's the no big problem, level. isn't it? Well, I mean, it just means that it's not as much fun as it were. And I did like, you know, the build of Lois's character was a little better done. That moment where she's starting to get the idea that maybe blowing Superman super identity of the world wasn't optimal, but she's still trying to convince him, like, no, this was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Lois, you, you done screwed the poochie. Like that is a screwed poochie. Like it's sitting there that having a feeling. Cosmo. It's on a second cigarette. That is a screwed poochie. You <laughs> <laughs> second cigarette. Uh, I mean, what else do you say? I mean, Jr. Jr. still looks good, but who knows how long he's going to last? I don't think he's on the next issue. So, that's disappointing. We don't even get that much out of the book now. So, do you see us even trying to bother with much longer? Uh, you know, I don't... Th- the problem isn't so much that as would I miss it if it went away. And I don't think I would, unfortunately. <laughs> well, that makes it pretty clear then, doesn't it? <laughs> like, I wish that I would, but... <laughs> Well, we got another chance at Superman, and we did enjoy some of it, so that's not a bad thing. Look, I'm saying like I've already decided. <laughs> you know, it's... <laughs> it's what? <laughs> it's just not our Superman, and it continues to not be our Superman, unfortunately. Yeah, that's true. But uh, let me tell you, over in Starfire 4, that was a great issue. I thought it was a great issue. There was good superheroing... With uh, taking care of the, the, the cheetah and origin for Terra, uh, a mad Stella Coriander taking a bounty out on Cory, uh, Commander taking a bounty out on Cory, and a nice rebuttal of the superheroes attract villains routine, plus a potential new mind controlling villain. No, uh, I totally enjoyed the mesmerizing rock monster. That was hysterical. <laughs> it. This book has a very light tone, but again, like DC is doing these little things well, like having this character build nicely and stay naive without being stupid. It, it cuts it close on some pages, though. It's an impossible um, mindset, I suspect. Well, all right, if that's all you're going to say. No, 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 <laughs> it's, it's simply a matter of... Got to cut that silence out. <laughs> yeah, I love I live for the silence. <laughs> No, don't. Don't live for the silence. Die for the silence. Okay. Three <laughs> factor of seven. Yeah. I'm not a huge Starfire fan. Like, I enjoyed some Teen Titans back in the day, but, you know, mostly because Deathstroke was awesome. Like, was, <laughs> they're like, yeah, go, teenage superheroes, go. Um, I want books like this to get lifespans. You know, like, we've... There have been ones I like more than you, ones you like more than me. Yeah. But creative ideas should be encouraged. And when you're doing things well, that should stick out. It has a great artist. It has a solid writer. Luke Kino is amazing. It has a consistent tone throughout. They're already building a strong back cast of characters. You know my feelings on new superhero books needing that. <laughs> yeah, right. So I want this to go well. Uh, the need... The, one funny thing about Amanda Connor and Jimmy Palmer is this constant need to throw Tara into the things <laughs> that I have never fully understood. Well, I mean, she's not a terrible character by any stretch. She's just not <clears throat> particularly interesting or have all that deep a history. But for whatever reason, that's their go-to. Like, hey, you need a guest? <laughs> well, I mean, you need a, a, a girl buddy for the girl. Uh, you know? Who the hell else is it going to be for... Fucking Coriander. Well, Superhero uh, level. Raven? Really? You want Raven in this book? I'm just saying, at least, you know, at least there's a tradition. Well, I suppose. I, I would just as soon not bother with a demon's daughter again. I suppose there's that. Yeah. But, so. uh, no, I, I think the book is building nicely and whatnot, and I think it's maintaining in tone. This was obviously a, the one-shot filler villain thing, but which was kind of awesome in and of itself. In fact, that it was hysterically ridiculous <laughs> of a villain but handled in a you know not in a comedic way necessarily right and they didn't need to kill it 
they didn't play it fully for laughs, so... No, there was good adventure in here. There was good superheroing. As I said... <laughs> <clears throat> over in the Batman Annual 4, however... Uh, there's um the, the the standard revenge clot clot plot the standard revenge plot plot clot was a minor villain of Batman in the mid sixties. <laughs> I'm not even going to ask who drew him. <laughs> <laughs> Dick Sprang had a plot clot. Of course he did. Uh, set up by Freeze, Clayface, and Riddler um, against the semi amnesiac Wayne determining that his suffering shouldn't be wiped away and theirs left intact now that he's back and repossessing the manor from the city, which used it as Arkham. Let me say this. I really thought that Slot did his best Riddler here. I know that, you know, Batman 1 took fucking forever. Well, it wasn't Slot, was it? It was Tinian. <laughs> yeah, it was with Damn it. I was like, I don't, re- I don't remember uh, right, Slot so being let, in there. Let me, let me amend that. This is my favorite use of the Riddler recently. Yeah. In that here you have a guy who's so smart that he comes up with a genius plan. Yeah. And he's still the fucking Riddler, so he misses the basic <laughs> obvious truth that Bruce Wayne, not even Batman, rings down on, which is you could have found a way to focus on getting away or having a life, and you're too busy trying to ruin somebody else's <laughs> you are a green ass hat <laughs> a green ass hat title yeah <laughs> you're but a green ass hat it was you know it was a well done like on the other hand like non superhero Bruce Wayne kicking all three of their that's, asses that's why I say semi amnesiac because there's something in the back of his brain that still allows his muscle memory to take over and yeah. kicks on. Yeah, well, I mean, his muscle memory is terrifying. <laughs> like, imagine if you dropped a grape by that guy and you got kicked in the trachea. <laughs> but I didn't I didn't find it that bad. I just think that's an awful thin revenge plot. Well, they're insane. I think I think that and that factor was really brought to home. Well, like, it boils it down to the whole we can't be happy, so you're not going to be happy routine. Well, I think what you really have to focus on is that it's not their plan. It's the Riddler, who's a particularly weird freak. Well, that is true. <laughs> who convinces two other guy, insane people to go along with his insane plan to torture somebody. <laughs> it's not like all three of them, like, you, uh, you know, like, they listen to the Riddler. Like, of course it went horribly awry. <laughs> well, it, it seems like Freeze, of all people, would be a little smarter because... You're again thinking old freeze, <sighs> not new fifty two. Which I've had to say to you like fifty times, and now you're getting a little bit of revenge on me. It, so well, eat it's, a dick. It's easy to do, unfortunately. <laughs> not that. Um, <laughs> that seems like it would be challenging. That was good timing. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, is like you, these are characters we've known for years. Having to recreate them in my head is constantly irritating. Right. Hmm. But in this scenario, Freeze is another adject super loon. He's not, you know, obsessed with his well, like he's obsessed, period. And Clayface is a full on fucking bucket of shit loon head. <laughs> All right. Having made our uh incredibly accurate and strange and disturbing description of the moment, we're gonna move on to a book we like. What do you got? <laughs> we got Bizarro for. Uh, oh, goody gumdrops. I cannot believe I look forward to a Bizarro miniseries. Jimmy, Colin, and Bizarro meet Zatanna in Branson, Missouri. Of all places. Where Bizarro volunteers for Z's show, and it turns out he's a pretty good magician. (laughs) He portals through various realms, swapping bodies with Jimmy and getting a hand from Dead Man, which is probably the highlight. Yeah. And, uh... (laughs) <laughs> Colin slapping around hipsters. <laughs> a chupacabra slapping around his I mean, How do you ask for more? It is a ridiculously funny book. <laughs> of all the comedic DC things going on right now, this is by far... This is the, the only best. one that's making me laugh. Um, 
Power Girl and Harley Quinn makes me giggle. Amusing. This makes me laugh. Yes. Uh, I think that this is a really strong book. I think that the art... I want to follow this artist wherever he goes. <laughs> With, uh, oh, I didn't change over yet. Uh, Duarte. Yeah. Yes. Phenomenal. Duarte. Like, such a fun style. Perfectly suited for this. I'm almost sad a, to see this go. And he makes a pretty cute Zatanna. Well, you think everything is a pretty cute Zatanna. Yeah. <laughs> You know, you just identify sometimes. <laughs> oh, I just implied I identify with fishnets. <laughs> Ooh. Let's move on to um, <laughs> Black Canary 4. <laughs> oh, can we? Ah, you gotta get it over with, dude. The longest task is the one that's delayed. <laughs> the lima bean of the spread. <laughs> so, Bo Maves Mystery is solved through flashback origin. Music star replaced by Dinah. She's taken ditto to give, to, to, to give her over to Amanda Waller. What? In exchange for her own canary cry. Which makes... Bores me to tears. At which point, ditto just walks off and returns to Dinah anyway. Yeah, she just is like, okay, bye, after some white ninja interrupts the exchange. And she's like, none of you were smart enough to watch me, so I'm out. Bye. Which, by the way, if anyone <coughs> ever thinks that Amanda Waller would continue to pay you off after a ninja <laughs> showed up and stole the prize... <laughs> You're an idiot. Yeah. No, everything about this book drives me insane. It is like the worst episode of Josie and the Pussycats ever. <laughs> I hey, you know, hates it. I what, hates it so Where it doesn't much. do a bad uh, a job on the art. Let, let's say that. It is not a terrible art, but it, it's very stylish and uh, not a style I'm particularly fond of. I think there, you know, it's got that independent book feel. It does. It doesn't feel like Black Canary. It doesn't feel like I'm enjoying myself. I <laughs> hate it. I want to burn it with fire. Every time I see this book in the pile, I'm like, son of a bitch, is not canceled this yet? It's almost done. I have given it up. Whoa, wait a minute. What happened in this? Oh, that's still... Okay, never mind. Anyway. Uh, stupid movie. Stupid movie. The same movie from last episode. It's, it's killing me. I don't want to watch it anymore. Um, over in Constantine 4. Constantine 4 is John being John in the context of Veronica, his magic bandmate who is fading to nothing for no reason. Because nothing happens for a reason... In Constantine, except that he's a jackass. You sleep with John Constantine and fucking magic <laughs> freaking mushrooms eat you alive. He's is what it comes down to. drunk, wandering around town, ghosts in tow, uh, uh, some skull tentacle thing taking them one at a time or groups at a time. The, the tentacle skull thing may or may not be Veronica. It's not clear to me. It seems to be. John believes yeah. that it is. Yeah. So John's, um, lo- the lost love of John's life, because he's only got 4,700 of those, <laughs> yeah. has turned into a ghost-eating, friggin' mouth-gnashing vine. Which seems to be beneficial to him in one degree, because he gets rid of those ghosts off his ass. But increases his guilt, so you have to look at that. <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> uh, it was an alright read. I, I wasn't overly impressed. I was... Happier with it than I was one and two. Yeah, I mean, the book is... I've enjoyed it pretty consistently. You far less so. But it is moving forward. It's storytelling a strong pace. It knows all the notes to hit with the John Constantine story. Yeah. Like, you know, weird, freaky horror. Off um, putting ex-girlfriends. Like, you know, <laughs> but at the same time, it's like when we did the Van Lenti Conan back always. It's like, right, everything's there. But at no point in my life, it it wasn't gelling just precisely. It was, I know Conan's supposed to do this, so I'm going to have him do this. It didn't really flow from Conan being Conan. Hack more successfully, Conan. (laughs) And that's what I feel is happening here. Right. At any rate, fuck that book. Also, another one that's disappearing. Although, each time you say that, another one shows up. And fuck this next book, Batmite 4. 
That Might 4 is one big 22-page fuck-off to fanboys that can't handle change, as personified by Gridlock and assisted by Booster Gold. Wow, that's a very apt analysis. Who the hell are you? <laughs> and it's ridiculous. And if you want to make a commentary, I'd appreciate it if you did it a little more subtly. Well, I think having that might make commentary is probably subtle in a horrifying way. But turning, <laughs> turning Booster Gold into Black Gold and telling him to sneer didn't strike your funny bone? Not really. Uh, I... <laughs> that might be some bitter disappointment. It is. Of it really is. all the people, is. I would have been excited to see get a mini series. Like, <laughs> this is, Batmite is, is, you know, I'm making cartoon analogies because obviously that's where my mind is at. But this is like Captain Caveman. This is not good. <laughs> the, at no point. Actually, Black Gold. Looking back on the page, Black Gold did amuse me a little bit. Uh, Good, but I mean, it's more his protestations that he shouldn't be black gold than actually being black gold. I think the only thing that salvaged this compared to some of the other ones is that it's a booster gold issue. Yeah, and yeah, he's it's and it's a hard it's a hard pill for you to swallow that booster gold is the saving grace of anything. Well, you know, the <laughs> next issue has the inferior five, which is a guilty pleasure of mine. But at the same time, I can't imagine that's done in a way that doesn't want to make me vomit. Nope. It ain't. Sorry about that, dude. <laughs> so. <laughs> Super. Oh, well. What can I tell you? It's a good thing this is a mini because it would not last much more than four for me. No, I mean. Now, here's my question, though. Like, you've come to the point where you purge pretty successfully now. But the fact that it is bat might. Does this survive for a while just because it's a Batmite miniseries? Is that, that, that the very idea that there is a Batmite miniseries is so novel and so rare that it may sit in the box unread and side over for a couple of years? <laughs> I like. I'm not gonna lie. I could totally believe that. that's why you know just because it's like well, it's not really a Batman thing because there are like Gotham Knights left your collection pretty goddamn quick. Yeah, it did. Like, Shoo you. <laughs> Go suck somewhere else. Oh, that's a good title. <laughs> Go suck somewhere else. <laughs> Over at Detective Forty Four, there's a lot of fours this month. What the hell? Everything ends in four this month. Literally, Superman, Starfire, Batman Annual, Bizarro, Black Canary, Constantine, Batmite, Detective. They all came out. They're the same all time. four or forty fours. That's fucking creepy. Dude. Go play your numbers. That's bizarre. Bizarro, also a four. Whoa. Over in Detective 44, there's this Joker bot on the loose, and Jim has to deal with it, along with Yip, taking a payoff from Falcone for the seating chart of a special ops, special cops only showing of the circus. They always got to work the circus in the Batman somehow. Hey, you know. You can't have tradition. Batman for much longer without a circus. You can't go, a, can you go a year, I think? Maybe a yes, year? Yes, you, you actually, no, I mean, <coughs> I mean mid-80s, Batman went a couple of years without a uh, circus. <laughs> but it's never long. No. <laughs> so there's this cop only showing of the circus, and there's that, as soon as you hear that, you know something horrifying is planned. Dude, the last thing you should ever do if you're an honest police officer is go to a cop only anything in Gotham. Yes. <laughs> That's like getting involved in a land war in Asia. That's a terrifyingly bad idea. Falcone is going to kill any clean cops not on his take. The Joker bot, run by Joker's daughter... Your favorite. Yeah, um, ...sends Yip, Harvey, and Montoya's car off the bridge, giving Harvey the opportunity to fake Yip's death so she can roll over on Falcone and go into witness protection. Jim beats the Joker bot and ruins Daughter's Day, noting she's no Joker replacement, buddy. I you, did. you ain't no fucking Joker. There's, there's, <laughs> there were literally three things that I liked in this issue, and that's it. Yeah? One was um, Jim Gordon dropping the Joker's daughter in one punch. Like, yep. I'm like, fine, done. You, woo. <laughs> like, Jim Gordon is not Batman, and if he drops you in one punch, you are a fucking B-level player. <laughs> Uh, two, I enjoy the fact that for a moment the book allowed you to believe 
that Bullock let Yip die when he thought she was yeah. working for Falcone. Yeah, yeah. Because you totally interpreted it that way I at did. first. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. So throwing a little darkness onto Harvey Bullock, like, well played there. Like that. And the third and most appealing thing about this book yeah. is at the very end when Bullock looks at Gordon's like, grow your hair, you look like an idiot with a mohawk. <laughs> These are my highlights. <laughs> Uh, aside from the fact that they have to bring in the circus again, um, the plan doesn't seem too bad. Then, uh, Yip force feeds information only to roll over on him. Hey, that's not bad. That happens a lot. It's, it's not an unknown plot arc, but you know, I, I thought screwing around and making it seem like you said that Yip was going to die. And then going, no, no, no. It's like this. That wasn't too bad. No, that I was, wasn't too bad at all. I was legitimately impressed with that. Yep. <sighs> Let me tell you something about this fucking Batman 44. <laughs> when I saw Azarello's name on the cover, <laughs> I had a glimmer of hope and, 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 and a shard of brightness in my mind that I was going to get a quality bat book out of this title. <laughs> we are treated to a Batman manhunt. Gritty, in the streets, personal, as Bats tracks down the death of a 15-year-old who made a deal with the Penguin, then Mr. Bloom, then was shot by mistake by a... Excuse me, read my sentence properly. Was shot by a mistaken, disgruntled cop... Oh boy. And the mutated man bat style to fly away dies starting a whole mystery. I like this book a lot better. <laughs> and I think Azarello has to hang around a lot more often on the bat books. There are a couple cool things. Like, obviously, the whole Mr. Bloom thing makes it a little rough. Secondly, this completely read, like, Azrael is like, fine, I'm going to write this, but not one reference will be made to Jim Gordon being Batman. Yeah. This read, like, Batman the entire way through the, it's all him in the bat suit, no fucking robo bunny ears. <laughs> so, at no point does this feel like anything other than Bruce Wayne Batman, does it? Yep, not at all. Secondly, this book has a very clear spirit inspiration with them using the words oh, yeah. all yeah, over yeah. the place. It's an awesome looking book. Everything about it was well done, particularly the opening sequence with the penguin. Well, it's hard to beat Jock on Batman. It's very difficult. He, you, but particularly because, like, playing into that spirit thing, it's just. <clears throat> Batman has been not my most traversed road. In the <laughs> but this was a solid issue. If I came across this one, I would grab it. Good. Good. That's that's as as good as we get for Batman right now. You know, Azrael. <laughs> you know, Azrael writes Batman a little too deep too often. Like his six issue run. Um, you know, like Batman. Hmm? Do you remember uh, following Hush? He had that six issue. Yeah. And once again, it was all about a dead kid and. Ooh. Yeah, but I think the the personal ones need more space at times. No, but you know what? I think Azrael would be a better better Batman writer if he lightened his touch on Batman a little uh, bit. I, okay, I can see what you're coming from now. Yeah, that's where I'm going with. It. I'm not saying that he doesn't do a good job. First <laughs> off, I love Brad Azrael. <laughs> Second, how, however, is that I think. If he didn't keep shoving himself into mid seventies Neil Adams down, <laughs> a light touch might offset some of these a little bit. As, Maybe, uh, as Maybe. opposed to the a consistency of morose dead children's stories, as fun as they are. Oh, I didn't say anything about fun. <laughs> I said personal and high quality, and that they are those. But I think you'd be able to appreciate it more with the occasional lighter touch. Oh, sure. And, and to be fair, he had more of that in the six-issue arc than in the single one for obvious reasons. Like the stuff with Killer Croc and his dentist. Right. That was neat. <laughs> I remember that. Ooh. Was it Broken City? Yeah. Yeah. Broken City. 
Um, over in Sinestro 15, we finally break the trend of the numbering. <laughs> <laughs> Sinestro contracts... too cool to follow anyone else. Absolutely right, baby. In Sinestro 15, Sinestro contracts Lobo to capture Saint Walker, assisting the uh, world Arklu. What? There's a planet named Arklu? I don't know. With a drought. Um, Sinestro thinks his blue ring can assist the yellow somehow, even though he doesn't really explain how he believes that well, or remember, why. Remember, every ring is heightened when a blue uh, ring is nearby. I thought it was just the green. No, I thought that, it was, I thought it was all of them. Like well, they made the blue, the blue is a support, or either that or Sinestro figures he knows a way to make that happen. Well, that, I'm thinking it's the latter because I mean, why would hope bolster rage? Well, fear. Yeah, but if if the it helps every ring theory holds, why would hope bolster rage? Well, why would hope? bolster fearlessness you know like uh, well yeah if anything which is why which is what i'm saying he's got some kind of consider this for a second yeah uh if we were to really work this area out it would the easiest ring for hope to affect quickly and successfully would be fear hmm take hope away and you're left with a lot of fear there you are it is the Uh, quickest emotional parallel you can find to any of those Except maybe the love one, and, you know, I really don't want to see a St. Walker freaking Star Sapphire miniseries anytime soon. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm fine with that myself. <laughs> uh, along the way, however, uh, the yellow ring keeps picking Lobo, and he's having none of it. <laughs> Which amused me. He's like, go away, man! Uh, Sinestro saves planet Arklu and uses War World to terraform it, since uh, content people... Offer no opposition uh, to order. <laughs> I love Sinestro so much. Uh, I did not care to see Lobo in this book, although it drives me cut his own finger off is kind of amusing. It drives me nuts that I have to buy a book with a villain be, as the protagonist because the hero books are largely so poor to me. <laughs> also, I don't know who revamped Lobo, but Crystals in the Face is the... It's Post dumb. Doomsday is horrible. Yeah, it, it's ridiculous. I hate it. <laughs> it just looks silly. Like, I can't. I was just like, come on. Grow your mustache back. Put your knee pads on. And just go back to sucking full time. Go back to sucking full time. So, no, that's not a bad plan for him. I'm, I'm just curious about this whole St. Walker thing. And, you know, I, I am... Intrigued, but it's better than the original plan they were going to do for St. Walker and the Blue Lanterns. Which was... You're going to have him go back in time. Oh, just stop that right now. Let's go into Harley and Power Girl because I don't want to know anything about time travel. Yeah, St. Walker, Texas Ranger. Oh my fucking... Oh... (laughs) You have been waiting hours to use that, haven't you? Nope, once again, in the moment... Can you just plot something out once? You wouldn't believe me. Uh, probably not. So, <laughs> I hate you so much. <laughs> you asshole. Harley Quinn and Power Girl number four. Fun, 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 till the daddy takes the deeper bird away. <laughs> Vartox is under mind control, but that's broken by the purring... Of the catacorn, which is just ridiculously funny. Uh, <laughs> the catacorn she met uh, when almost eaten by a giant fish. I think we missed an issue because I don't remember a giant fish. Yes, we totally missed uh, one or two, actually. Ah, well, the real villain shows up. Some jackass with shotgun nuns who gets embarrassed at how impressive Vartox's schlong is. What? <laughs> this book is insanity. Of course, if anyone was going to be impressive, it's going to be Vartox. God bless Vartox. And but apparently you know, he has. Ah, but this guy's got shotgun nuns. What is he worried about? He's not worried. That's why he's Vartox. He's <laughs> never worried. No, the other guy. The villain. 
shows up uh, with the shotgun nuns. See, the the villain is so poor though that it's like I don't even care. It's just show me Vartox because he's funny, and you know make <laughs> make Kara kiss him <laughs> because she hates to kiss him, but she wants to so badly she just won't fucking admit it because it looks like Zardoz. <laughs> <laughs> She won't have it. I want to get through this episode because it's DC's and we're getting close to things I don't care about. Uh, Over in Justice League 3001, number four. Oh my God, here it is again. This is a theme tonight. I'm telling you. Um, New Flash gets a spotlight this time around as uh, Ariel slash Lois and Bats sends her to Planet Nirvana on a training mission uh, that Flash doesn't actually know is fake and you know, training mission, uh, where she meets Mirror Master from our time, hiding out from Ariel. They come across piranha bears, which amused me, um, and Mirror Master escapes through reflective ice that Flash makes, and she gets retrieved by the Justice League. Oh, and the whole thing is told by Flash to a drunk Diana who abandons her Mid story <laughs> to pass out. <laughs> I mean, if they hadn't already done Piranha Penguins far better than this, <laughs> the bears were kind of funny. You know, obviously they were going for a retro thing, and I thought that the uh, calling Mirror Master Mister Mirror was hysterical. <laughs> There's a couple of really light, funny moments. In this Mirror movie. Master. It just it hasn't hit the peak of. What Giffen no, and, and Demantis are capable of, and I just don't know if it will. I, I find it unlikely it will. Uh, it's been so long since that. It's been thirty fucking years since no, that it's synchronicity insane was. To say that, yeah, isn't it? I, I, it makes me unhappy to say it was thirty years ago that I read books that made me truly happy. <laughs> that, is, that is screwed up. Uh, but you know, it is good. It is entertaining. It's precarious at points, like you mentioned before, where we're not sure how long they can really sustain this, whether they can get back to even funnier adventures, whether this book is even suited to that in particular. It definitely has a darker tone, so... (sighs) It's hard to say, but I guess we'll probably play it out. I almost got the uh, complete run of 3001. Oh, yeah? Or 3000, you mean? Of 3000. But um, the shipping kind of fucked it. So I was <laughs> like, nah, I'm not going to bother this time around. Maybe after uh, Emerald City. Fair enough. Over in Wonder Woman 44, uh, Aegeus has left wounded Diana in the alley, but she, of course, recovers and goes home to be told by Hera that the death of the fates have weakened the gods, and that Hephaestus has discovered someone used his forge to make Aegeus' weapons. <gasps> Meanwhile, Donna is walking around London all fish out of water, meeting uh, the blue-haired girl from last ish who gives her clothes and after Donna rescues her from a beatdown. You know, there's, uh, what can I say? Uh, Aegeus seems like a eighth string villain we don't know why he gives a shit we don't know who's really helping him although it's if we think for a couple of minutes it'd probably be quite easy to figure out <laughs> um the fact that uh they used to face this is forge is nice it's like he was taking a nap and somebody just wandered in and started banging on things and making weapons that amuses me yeah he's like hey man <laughs> uh, the thing I- the book ha- was starting to build potential, and it just kind of threw it all away. Like when the Donna Troy period, when they oh, were introducing yeah. that character and the way they brought that about, I was really impressed with. And then they haven't really done anything. Oh, like now I'm, you know, a punk in London. Like what? <laughs> it doesn't really fit, does it? I mean, why did she pick London? It just—I thought they were going somewhere very cool, and I was willing to put up with, um, you know, finding out. 
Finch finding her voice as a writer because, like, it seems like it would be super challenging. I'm, you know, what am I going to do, judge? <laughs> but yes, I'm going to judge because I'm fucking going to have a podcast about comics, and that's what we do is we judge things, <laughs> deal with it. But at the same time, you know, I wouldn't write a phenomenal comic book day one. Shit, no. So I thought they had done some cool things and we're building somewhere, and it just doesn't feel like it's going anywhere. Nah, it's it's, it's, it's kind of stalled right now, isn't it? It is not. It needs to. Step it up nicely. It doesn't help that if you take away Cheetah and Ares, Wonder Woman has, like, no villains, per se. Well, they keep trying to give her villains, and they keep making them one-note chumps. It's hard, man. You know? People that can fight gods just don't drop all out of the sky all that often, because that <laughs> happened when they became gods. So. <laughs> I suppose so. Uh, over in Batgirl 44... I wrote a lot about this one, man. Yeah, a lot every, every fucking panel, something new was occurring here. That kind of makes it hard to, to, to put, make things succinct there. You know what I'm saying, pal? <laughs> so, Babs is confronted by a velvet tiger. Crazy-ass, vengeful CEO importing illegal tigers to kill people with. Wow. That is a supervillain fucking comic book character trope right there. Just a little bit. I'm here, and well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to kill you in the most bizarre and uselessly impractical way possible. Uh, that's, yep, that's me. That's what I'm doing. I like it. Babs takes uh, Tiger's abilities to Cater, who makes a connection between the code Tiger used and Jeremy, ex of Tiger's. What? Shit. What? Who's Who's been coerced into helping her? <clears throat> he gives up Tiger's location. Babs heads out there, finds Alicia, having tracked Joe there, what, uh, to being hostage to murder, uh, Babs knocks out the tigers that she was going to use to kill Joe and Alicia, <laughs> what, Alicia saves Joe, and uh, a remote control motorcycle knocks out Tiger and evacuates Babs, uh, Barbara tries to get Frankie a job, but she's got superhero plans because now she's mentally controlling motorbikes. Wow! This was fucking dense. Yeah, I officially loathed it. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, I fought to like Batgirl, and I thought, again, it was going to do something interesting. And it said, like, this is the most convoluted piece of friggin' garbage. Like, <laughs> everybody, uh, just... <laughs> Spit uh, it out. You no, can do it. It was just everyone she knows has eighteen thousand horrifying plot points in a twelve issue arc. <laughs> like, <laughs> and they can all do miracles, and all they got to do is bang out a little bit of code to do those miracles. Like Spider Man, every friend of Spider Man's has either dated a supervillain or a superhero, or been a supervillain or a superhero. Literally, without fail, almost every single one of them has some sort of huge connection to the life of crime. Yeah. And that's happened over 600 issues. Every friend of Barb's has done that in 15 fucking minutes. It's true. It's a bit dense. Now, a lot of these characters do seem like they have a lot of potential. I don't want to bag on them for that. But potential means showing us how they develop and not simply going, this character does that and that's how they're going to help her. No, the, boom. The, the night they don't have day. to work on it. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to improve their skills. They don't have to train. They don't have to make mistakes. They're just like, oh, you need this? Here, boom, I've done it. Like, Ugh. 18 people know she's Batgirl. All of them have, like, one, <coughs> one is driving her motorcycle with her mind. Another one's building all of her gear. Another one is now her love interest and lunch buddy and businessman and partner like. <laughs> and we un, under normal circumstances we like a broad set of supporting oh yeah and I still do this yeah. doesn't change that but but not all of them have to be directly involved in her doing her job or dating a villain or it's it's just and she can, she can just have pals and then the villains that she's like who has she fought since the revamp <sighs> That idiot who was selling people secrets, Livewire, and this dipshit. Yeah. Oh, and the per and 
the guy who dressed up like her, Batman girl. Oh, yeah. Or Batgirl man. Yeah, whatever. Uh, I made that up. So I'm not going to get into that one again. But <laughs> it's just, like, I'm sorry, like, Batgirl's official. I, like, I've tried very hard and just keep pushing harder and harder. The tiger thing was ridiculous. Velvet Tiger is worse. <laughs> I had to sell secrets. I didn't think she'd kill people. She gets what she wants. She's my ex-girlfriend. You're the worst character ever. <laughs> like, was. that is the wussiest thing bad, anyone's <laughs> ever said. She gets what she wants. Then punch her in the face or something. Don't just give in. Jesus Christ. <sighs> Let's finish up. Yeah. On a high note. Oh, what do we got? As we always like to with the DCs. Because <laughs> there's so few. Well, I mean, it takes forever to get to them as well. So, Astro City 27. Ah. This is the very curious story of American Chibi. <laughs> it's the stupidest <laughs> name ever. <laughs> it's, just, it's a ridiculous name. But, I mean, if you know what a chibi is, then calling a, I don't, a particular way. chibi an American chibi is not a big chibi deal. A chibi is the Japanese version of Scotty Young doing things. Oh, okay. Oh, look, the little kid version of the superhero. Good, because if you said you it one more time, squish you're, down you're and make chibiing him cute. the awesome fierce right there. <laughs> just squish him down and make him cute and have him do the same shit. That's chibi. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this movie suddenly got not interesting. Yep, no, um, a little. Her story is that uh, game designer Marguerite's game world has become a conduit to the unbodied, which is actually a pretty good name. Yes, not I like it. I like it. There's a lot of weird names that people could use for a concept like that, and. 99% of them would be utterly and completely ridiculous and dumb. But Busick pulled it off with the unbodied. <laughs> Who, through uh, that particular connection, Chibi is allowed to go between Marguerite's imagination and our world. Investigating game characters coming here, Chibi and Honor Guard go to the game world where, the tempor- where they temporarily defeat the endgame boss. But Chibi has to stay to ensure the victory. Aww. Uh, I thought it was very sweet. Aww. It was another nice, younger, new character. It's literally like he heard me. It's so freaking <laughs> weird. It's, that's some p- peculiar timing, isn't it? Uh, but no, I, it, it was a well-put-together book. You're like, like, enough with these old motherfuckers, all right? <laughs> Do you ever find these? Like, I was reading this book, and I'm like, you know what would be great? Is if the American Chibi had a villain... Who is based in Japanese anime? Yeah. So then, American Chibi could fight the Animaniac. <laughs> They'd never let him have the Animaniac, though. Sure, they would. You just have to put the. Uh... Oh, wait, it's still Warner Brothers. They might. Well, maybe you, you don't even need to well, think about it. But it's his creator-owned property. A N I M E dash I A C. Oh, anime dash Yeah. Oh, he could do that. He could get that up. Kurt. Tune in. <laughs> Pay attention. Tell me you wouldn't read the uh, American Chibi versus the anime EAC. I, I totally would. <laughs> and there's our high note, and there's our DC episode, and get me the hell home. Bless you, fuckers. <laughs> and away. The Mean Geek is recorded live at the Reverend Mad Duck's apartment whenever the hell we can get to it. Find us on Facebook, Stitcher, Twitter under at the Meaner Geek. Subscribe to us through RSS. Or we can be located at our own site, www.themeangeek.com. And most importantly of all, you can find us as a proud member of the Comic Podcast Network. Email us directly at themeanergeek at gmail.com. Mind drink now? You may. <laughs>